Sputnik con Hiromi Osaki. Bienvenidos a la conferencia magistral de la artista japonesa Hiromi Osaki, Sputnik, titulada Universidad Médica de Tokio para Mujeres Rechazadas. Sputnik es una artista radicada en Tokio, conocida por su trabajo cinematográfico e instalaciones multimediales que exploran las implicaciones sociales y éticas de tecnologías emergentes. Sus trabajos más recientes se han presentado en la Trienal de Arte de Seutochi 2016, donde creó el primer pabellón de arte permanente en el sitio de arte Venés en Teshima. Desde 2017 ha sido asistente del Laboratorio de Medios del MIT, en donde dirigió el Grupo de Investigación de Diseño de Ficción. En la actualidad es profesora asociada de diseño en la Universidad de Artes de Tokio. Sus piezas han sido incluidas en las colecciones permanentes de museos como el Museo Nacional de Arte y Diseño Victoria y Albert y el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo del Siglo XXI en Kanazawa, Japón. Bienvenida Sputniko y adelante. Hi everyone, my name is Sputniko and I'm an artist based in Tokyo, Japan, and I'm very happy to be part of the Aleph Festival. And I wish I was there in person to talk to you in Mexico. But unfortunately, right now, it's very, very difficult to travel between Japan, Mexico. So I'm going to give you this video talk. And today I'd like to talk to you about um, my background as an artist and some of the works I've done, especially on gender and technology. And also about Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women, which looks at this scandal that happened in Japan, where medical schools in Japan Uh, in 2018, we found that many of them were deducting points of female applicants to reject women to study in medical schools, to deliberately limit the number of women becoming doctors in Japan, which was a big scandal. And um, I, as an artist, I created a work in reaction to this scandal in Japan. So um, I'm going to share you um, my presentation to go through my works and talk to you about myself. So Spotniko, that's my artist name, but my real name is Hiromi Ozaki. So I was born in Japan, but my mother's British, my father's Japanese, and my parents are both mathematicians. They're math professors. So just like my parents, when I was growing up in Japan, I loved maths. I loved computer programming. I was a complete science geek. So um, actually, um, at, when I was um, a teenager, I skipped my final year of high school. I really wanted to, I loved math so much that I went to university a year early. So I went to Imperial College London uh, to study mathematics and computer science. So Imperial College is, is a little bit like MIT in the UK. So this is a very science specialized university. So I was studying AI, computer science, a genome, uh, like uh, bioinformatics, all these amazing new tech. But somehow after studying um, technology, maths in university, I decided actually I like to talk about issues and technologies through art, through my work. So for my master's, I studied at the Royal College of Art London and uh, I went to a course called Design Interactions and I graduated in 2010. And uh, while I was RCA, I created um, several works, including Menstruation Machine, uh, which I'm going to talk about later, uh, Crowbot Jenny, which is a robot that can communicate with crows. And several of these works became really viral on the internet. So it spread through the internet, my YouTube videos were seen. And suddenly I was invited to show my works in MoMA in New York or Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. And suddenly from being a student, I was in museums showing as artist. And uh, in 2013, when I was uh, 28, I was actually uh, invited to become an assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab to set up a new research group called Design Fiction Group. So I was at the MIT for four years. So MIT Media Lab is a research institute which is a really uh, cross 
a disciplinary like um, re research institute that looks at design, tech, science. So it was an amazing place where there were scientists, designers and technologists working together and making projects together. So I loved being at MIT. So I was there for four years. And in 2017, uh, I came back to Japan after many, many years abroad. And I became an associate professor at University of Tokyo in Institute of Industrial Science. So they created a new design lab there. So I was there for two years, and now I'm currently an associate professor of design at Tokyo University of Arts. And um, other than teaching and showing my works in uh, different places, I also give talks in, uh, for example, I became a TED Fellow from 2019. And also World Economic Forum uh, selected me to be a young global leader in 2017. So. I went to the Davos conference conference in 2020, January. So, so I give talks in various places, like this is from my TED 2019 when I gave a TED fellow talk. So that, that's my super short introduction. And I like to talk um, a little bit about my research theme, my central theme where, when I'm making work or teaching in university. So today, I don't know how many of you have heard of the word speculative design. Maybe some of you, but maybe a lot of you don't really, haven't really heard of this term before. So speculative design is basically, it's um, a design to stimulate discussions about the social, cultural, and ethical implications of technologies. So this is a term first coined by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, who used to be my professors at Royal College of Art. And basically, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word design, they think, well, like design is probably to make something look beautiful, like a uh, beautiful fashion or something very usable, like a functional smartphone. Like design is something that makes something aesthetically beautiful, functional. So design is for solving problems uh, that's out there in the world. But speculative design, uh, we like to think that design can do a bit more than just solving problems we know of today. And we like to think that design can ask questions about problems that could arise in the future. Like design could create discussions about possible consequences of emerging technologies that we have right now. And so I think some of you might wonder, well, why do we need to ask you know, questions about the future? Why do, do we need to design to stimulate discussions about technologies? And one example I like to show you is that um, you think artificial intelligence um, is, I think a lot of people think AI is very efficient, AI knows everything, but actually even AI has scandals and problems arising recently. And in 2018, I don't know if you've seen this news, there was this scandal um, that was uncovered that Amazon, they were trying to develop an AI tool for hiring new people. But they found that this AI was actually discriminating against women. So if the CV or resume contained anything related to women, this AI was deducting points of these women. And I, I, I'm going to explain to you why this kind of thing happened with AI. So artificial intelligence basically um, works a lot on data. So AI works on the data from the present and data from the past. So it learns from those data and then makes decisions based on the past data, which means that if the data from the past and the present contains any biases or contains any prejudices, the AI actually learns these biases and prejudices that we have in our society as the best solution and recreates those biases and prejudice. 
So Amazon, unfortunately, in the past, they didn't hire that many women. Uh, they had a lot of male businessmen, male engineers. So in the data, AI looked at the past data and realized, well, there are not that many women being hired to Amazon, which means possibly women are probably not good candidates to be hiring. So AI learned that. So when Amazon was giving these new CV and resume to the algorithm AI, AI was automatically rejecting these female applicants. And it was very fortunate that Amazon realized that its AI tool was creating these biased judgments. But uh, you know, I, I think there are many, many situations around the world where we are still using these artificial intelligence without realizing that it has the potential to be very, very biased or prejudiced against certain groups of people. And this is an example that happened in gender, but there's already the examples happening with human race, or you know, it could happen in many, many other categories, like where you're born or what, what kind of communities you're, you're with. And AI, we need to be asking these questions. We need to be discussing about these problems. And that's what speculative design uh, likes to do is we look at these technologies and we look at these problems and we, through our work, we try to discuss and think about what we could do about the future. So um, I'd like to show you one work um, which I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. It's called the Menstruation Machine. So this is a work I created at the Royal College of Art as my graduation piece in 2010. And this is a machine that allows men to experience the whole process of menstruation, which includes the bleeding and also the pain you have in your stomach. And actually, if you go through menstruation, you go through so much more than just pain and bleeding. You, know, you, you can go through many mental instability and so on, but I decided you know, simulating the pain and the bleeding is a good start at least uh, for me to try to make more people experience it and understand what women have to go through. So um, in this work, the reason why I decided to design a machine that allows men to experience menstruation is because when I was at Imperial College, College studying uh, mathematics and computer science, I was starting to become really um, a bit, uh, feeling a bit strange about this, all this technology that I'm, I'm studying or learning about because humans have achieved so many things. Humans are creating AI, humans have traveled to the moon, landed on the moon. There's so many amazing progresses happening in uh, civilization. But I was thinking, well, there's all, all these crazy, amazing developments, but why as a woman studying engineering, like in my class of 100 people, there's only nine women studying computer science. Most of my classmates are men. And right now I am still bleeding every month. I have menstruation every month. I am in pain and it's really difficult. And it feels like why hasn't humans solved the issue of menstruation? Like why do, we ha why do I have to suffer with such a thing that's been going on from the ancient times? Why is this problem of menstruation being ignored? And I started doing research about menstruation, technology, and the gender gap happening in technology and science. And I just found so many, so many issues surrounding um, this gender and technology through the lenses of um, menstruation, which I'm gonna talk about later. So I, I decided if more men experience how difficult menstruation is. Maybe more men, uh, especially since technology and science have been very, very male dominated for so many years in the past, that maybe there's more people who think that this is an issue that needs to be solved and needs to be um, better for women. So 
I made a machine and in this work, I am acting as um, this uh, boy Takashi. So he is a transgender. So he likes to dress up as a female. He likes to wear makeup. He likes to you know, wear female clothes, but he decides that unless he experiences menstruation, he doesn't quite completely understand what it feels like to be a woman. So he decides to build a machine that allows him to fully experience the true meaning to be a woman, to be menstruating. So I created a music video based on this work. So I'm gonna show you the video. Oh, sorry, this isn't from the exhibition I did in Germany. So this work was shown in various museums like Germany, also in New York, MoMA. I did an exhibition and I'll show you a video of this work. You. When I put that menstruation machine video on YouTube, um, I was 25 at the time and it was still 2010. And right now in 2021, I think we see, I don't know if it's true in Mexico, but at least in Japan and also a lot in the United States and Europe, we see a lot of media, especially women's media, fashion magazines, women magazines, talking about menstruation, talking about issues of feminism technology. But 10 years ago, 2010, it was still considered a taboo, especially in Japan. No one really talked about menstruation in the media. 
and menstruation was seen as something that I should be embarrassed about, something I should not talk about. And I was, at the time, 10 years ago, I was really frustrated that menstruation affects the lives of so many people on this planet. At least half of the population of the planet have to go through menstruation, the, the difficulties or the pain and bleeding. But it was treated as if it didn't exist. It was treated like we couldn't talk about the problems. And I thought because it was considered a taboo, because we couldn't talk about it, that's the reason why we couldn't make it better for us. That was the reason why we couldn't use technology and science to make the lives easier for women. And as a student, I was doing all these research and I found that there were ways to make menstruation easier for women. For example, the contraceptive pills, People think that the contraceptive pills are uh, mainly often for contraception, but actually pills are very useful in reducing the PMS, reducing menstruation pain, or keeping uh, women's uh, balance, the biological hormone balance uh, in a good condition. So some people take the pill to, uh, to make menstruation feel better, or if you take the pill continuously, you could even reduce the number of menstruation to not just once a month, but maybe once every three months or once every six months. You could really control how many times you menstruate. And also there are other technology like IUD, which is sometimes called Murena. And this is a technology where you insert a very, very small equipment inside your uterus. And if you, Put, if you use IUD, it can reduce uh, the amount of menstruation drastically for many women. And uh, But these technologies, I think because especially 10 years ago, people didn't talk about it and it wasn't in the media at all. And I thought, well, like, this is really not great. Like I, I think women's voice needs to be heard, especially in technology and science. and if we don't speak out, then we're going to continue to be in pain or we're going to continue suffering with these health problems. And since I grew up in Japan, I'm sure you know that Japan it has a very big issue in gender discrimination. And Japan was full of the examples which I found that of gender uh, biases in technology. And one example I like to talk about is the example of the pill um, Viagra. So contraceptive pills were approved in the United States and Europe, most of the countries in the 1960s. And even if you're very late in approving, like Italy and China, they approved the pill in the 1970s. But Japan, actually, they approved the pill very, 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 very late. And they approved it in 1999, which was actually the very, very last country in the whole of United Nations. And the two last countries to approve the pill out of all the United Nations <laughs> countries was Japan and North Korea. And North Korea approved the pill in 1995. So Japan was even five years later than that. So uh, practically Japan was 40 years late compared to other countries in approving the pill. And this is the graph mapping um, the different countries uh, contraceptive pill approval year and also the gender gap ranking. So you can see that countries with a smaller gender gap tended to approve the pill much earlier, like in the 60s. And Italy and China a little bit later in the 70s and Japan all the way 1999. And what the reason why Japan didn't approve the pill for such a long time was that Japanese, many Japanese politicians who are oftentimes male, they said that if they approve the pill, then women could misuse the pill to become sexually too 
outward, sexually too aggressive. <laughs> and the pill could um, you know, be a bad influence on women. And actually, like, despite uh, being very, very slow in approving the pill, when Viagra came out, I'm sure you know Viagra is a medication to treat ED in, in men. And when Viagra came out, um, Viagra actually is not a super safe drug. Like when it first came out, it had more than 100 people dead from the side effects of Vi Viagra. But despite the side effects and having more than 100 people dying from taking Viagra, Japan was super, super fast in improving the Viagra. So they approved the Viagra in just six months in 1999. And they approved it three months before the contraceptive bills. And to me, it feels like I think the Viagra could have a very, very uh, big impact on men being sexually too outward, taking the Viagra. But obviously the Japanese politicians probably wanted to really use Viagra as soon as they can, maybe. So they approved the Viagra very, very fast, maybe one of the fastest countries in the world. And you can see here that pill takes more than, pill takes 40 years, Viagra takes six months and the pill, like I said, it's not just for contraception. It's very, very important for women in treating PMS or you know, menstruation pain. It's a very important medication for women. And you can see here, you think technology and science can be developed and can be spread in society in a very equal manner. Well, that's really not the case. And it's really impacted by who's in power and what kind of people are making the regulations and laws to allow these technology and science to be developed or spread. And this is a very, very easy example to see this big gender gap. And another example I like to show you is this um, graph, which I mapped the each country's gender gap score and also the percentage of how many women uh, give birth using epidural birth. So just to um, explain what this epidural birth is. Um, so women, if they give birth naturally, obviously uh, they have to go through a lot of pain and sometimes they can, that pain can be very, very dangerous too. So epidural birth is um, a treatment where women can receive this um, anesthetic to drastically reduce the pain that they have when they give birth. And uh, in Japanese, it's called mutsubunben, and uh, English is epidural birth. And you can see here uh, that countries with a smaller gender gap has greater percentage of women going through epidural birth. So in Finland or France, 89%, 82% of women uh, give birth using epidural birth. But in China and Japan, only like, for example, in Japan, only 6% of women give epidural birth. And I was amazed how this is very beautifully correlated with the gender gap. So big, the bigger, the smaller the gender gap, more women use this technology. And the bigger the gender gap, less women use this technology technology. And this is often um, the case where in Japan, uh, what happens is that, oh, people say that women, if they don't go through pain, if they don't feel the pain when they're giving birth, they're not a proper mother, you know, they can't love the child if they go, don't go through pain. So the, these kind of very old fashioned thinking and perceptions still exist, which makes women, avoids women from using this new technology and sciences. And this is very apparent in this case. So finally, I'd like to move on to talk about uh, my project, Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women. So this is a work I created in 2019. And you can see here that I am the president of this school and Tomomi Nishizawa, she is the chairwoman of the board of trustees. And this is 
a completely black humor fictional university that I founded. And this university I founded in reaction to this big scandal that happened in Japan in 2018. And they found out that many, many medical schools in Japan for all these years, so many years, they were deducting points of female applicants exam scores to deliberately reduce the number of women who became uh, their students. And they only found out in 2018 that they were doing this for so many years. And the excuse that they had as university, they said that, oh, even if we educate women to become doctors, they're gonna get married, have children and quit. So we felt, well, what's the point in educating women? It's, so that's the excuse that they said. So they apologized, but women were furious in Japan. And I, I think this news was, all, I think was um, broadcasted in BBC, CNN. It was an international scandal. And I think a lot of people were shocked how backward Japan was in terms of gender discrimination. So since 2018, the medical schools have stopped discriminating against women, but because of the tradition of discriminating against women, Japan has very, very few female doctors. So the ratio of female doctors in Japan is just 21%, and that's the lowest rank in OECD countries. And what happens when the very, very few women become doctors is that um, a form of structural sexism. So if very women are in power, and if very few women are in power, if very few women are in medicine, uh, these things like taking more than taking 40 years to prove the contraceptive pills, uh, these things happen, or epidural birth not being widespread in Japan. So they, there are many, many consequences that happen because of this kind of discrimination. And that leads to women's healthcare needs like PMS, childbirth, contraceptive, uh, becoming uh, very, very often overlooked in medicine, tech, and science. So in my university, um, I decided to take all the women who were rejected from the traditional Japanese medicine. So that's why I called it University for Rejected Women. And I decided that if Japan loves male doctors so much, well, as women, we're going to build the perfect elite male doctors that Japan loves. And we're going to make these amazing doctors much, much better than normal then. <laughs> so these perfect elite doctors we're gonna build and we'll pack them in a box and we're gonna deliver them all over Japan on these amazing drones to create the global leaders that would advance the future of medicine. So these are pictures of these men flying in the drone and you can see the men being built in the operation room. And you can see, this uh, male doctor being sent away to the hospital in Japan. And we made a university brochure, which details how, what the school life is like in this university. And we did this um, performance where we launched uh, the university and we built a first male doctor, which we packed in the drone. And we had um, about 500 people <laughs> Um, come together for our university launch day. So this is a performance we did in uh, Roppongi Art Night. And we even did an open campus of the university. So I'll show you the video. <laughs> Yeah, so 
um, that open campus exhibition was also quite a success. <laughs> and I'm going to show you a, a very cheesy university video that explains what the university is about. So I'll, I'll show you this video just now.皆さんこんにちは。ようこそ東京原点女子大へ。学長のスプツニコです。理事長の西澤智美です。本大学は最先端のテクノロジーを駆使し、女子生徒たちに医療での活躍の場を提供する学校です。医学の進歩を第一に
um, letter complaining about my work, but I, I think it's very important to raise this issue because I, it was such a big scandal that happened in Japan that it shouldn't be forgotten and we should really work hard to achieve better education and equal education for all gender, you know, women and men. So this is actually um, my university brochure. You could actually purchase it on Amazon. So this is a QR code. If you're interested in reading my university brochure, it's also in English. You could go to this link and I am selling these brochure for uh, 99 cents. So that's under $1. And all the profits of selling this university for my Tokyo Medical University for Reje Rejected Women goes to an NPO called Plan International. And Plan International is an NPO that's working to improve um, women's rights and also women's education around the world. So if you are interested in this work and if you like to read more about this university. And if you like to also help women's education, then oh. please um, support, uh, please check out this link and support Plan International. And let's hope for a better future for women's education, better future for science and technology with more inclusion. And I hope that's my uh, talk today. And I hope that, you know, my talk sort of gave different ideas and findings to some people listening right there in Mexico. So thank you so much.